Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Graduate School's three-minute thesis competition. We'll begin in one minute. Hi all, welcome to the Graduate School's three minute thesis competition. I'm Scott Adler, Dean of the Graduate School, and I'm delighted to have you here today. This is uh, one of my favorite events of the year. It's a fun opportunity to showcase the outstanding work of our graduate students. As you'll see, they're engaged in uh, cutting edge research at the forefront of their discipline. But unless you're one of a small group of specialists in their field, you're unlikely to hear much about the incredible work of these scholars. That's not just a shame, but in many ways, it's a missed opportunity to broaden our understanding of science and the value of this research. What we've learned as much as anything over the last year is how important it is for scholars and researchers to communicate very sophisticated and sometimes obscure analysis for a general audience. This has been critical to get us past the pandemic. As you'll see for almost everything we do as scholars, the essence of the research, the question to be answered is usually very relatable. The three minute thesis in effect is the elevator pitch of academe presenting complex research in an accessible way. Learning how to do this isn't easy. Starting last fall, 40 graduate students began a series of workshops to prepare for this competition. These workshops focused on storytelling, writing and presentation skills, and even won an improv comedy. In early February, we held a preliminary judging round to narrow the participants down to this final group of 10. As you can see, our finalists have worked very hard to get here. Having attended the dress rehearsal, I can tell you that these presentations are fabulous. Today's winners will receive $1,500 in research funds and the opportunity to advance to the regional competition to be held virtually on March 24th. Now, let me introduce our MC for today. My longtime friend, Bud Coleman, is a professor of theater and the Associate Dean for, the, for Arts and Humanities in the College of Arts and Sciences. He's also CU Boulder's commencement marshal. Bud will introduce our outstanding judges and set the stage for the competition. Welcome Bud, and thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much, Scott. It's an honor to be here. And I see that we have over 160 guests joining us this afternoon. So thank you so much for your support of these graduate students and the graduate school. We so appreciate you being here today. The three minute thesis academic competition or 3MT as we call it, was founded at the University of Queensland in 2008. 3MT cultivates students presentation and research communication skills and challenges them to describe their research with three minutes uh, to a general audience. To give you an idea of what that kind of challenge that is, most dissertations are about 80,000 words. If you were to read that out loud, it would take over 12 hours. These students have had to distill their thoughts into three minutes for a general audience. In addition to our winner and runner up, we also have the People's Choice Awards. That winner will receive a $500 in research funds and you'll be able to vote for your favorite at the end of the 10 presentations this afternoon. We'll 
I'll show you the URL so that you can vote. So take notes and pay attention. So just to describe the rules very quickly, the students are restricted to one single static PowerPoint slide, no slide transitions, no animations, just one static slide. They cannot use any additional electronic media, no sound or video files. Uh, they can't use any props. They're just uh, restricted to the use of their voice. Their presentations are restricted to three minutes and the presentations need to be in spoken word. No poems, no raps, no songs. On behalf of the Graduate School and these amazing 10 presenters, I want to thank you, our audience, for zooming in on a Tuesday afternoon to support intellectual inquiry, scientific discovery, artistic creation, and the dissemination of knowledge to the public. Uh, I want to introduce our esteemed panel of judges. Uh, we have Tom Check, distinguished professor and investigator for the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. We're also joined by Katherine Eggert, senior vice provost and associate vice chancellor for academic planning and assessment. We also have Daryl Maeda, associate dean for student success in the College of Arts and Sciences and they're joined by Charlie Mangiano, Senior Director and Multimedia Content Producer for Strategic Relations and Communications. The reason Charlie looks so rested is he recently retired. Congratulations, Charlie. Thank you again to our incredible panel of judges. And just to focus again, the 3MT is all about storytelling in its purest form. One human being using the spoken word to introduce to their audience new ideas, new concepts, new ways of seeing the world. We are so glad that you are here in our virtual meeting place today to sit around the fire and hear what our community members want to share with us today. First up, I'm going to welcome Maria Bastarus. Uh, she will be presenting on waves in periodic media. Mary is a PhD student in aerospace engineering sciences. Thank you, bud. Have you ever wondered how can a chameleon change its color and camouflage itself among its surroundings? This happens thanks to microscopic repeating patterns in the chameleon skin, like these hexagons here. These repeating patterns are why we call the chameleon skin a periodic medium. Now, in light waves, each color has a certain frequency. When light waves encounter a periodic medium, waves in a certain frequency range called the stop band fade away. So we see a certain color as a result. The chameleon can control and change its skin patterns at will which in turn changes the stop band and its skin color. But the best part is this phenomenon does not just take place in light waves, but in any type of wave, like sound waves or water ripples or vibrations in structures. Also, our periodic medium can be anything with a repeating pattern, even something like alternating granules or beads, which can be easy to make and find in nature. This offers us the potential to advance various fields like medical imaging, optical fibers, or controlling structural vibrations. Actually, it was the versatility of this phenomena that drew me into studying it for my PhD research. But soon afterwards, I realized that waves don't always act as we expect them to. Let me explain. Remember how light waves acted in the chameleon skin? Let's recreate this situation but with vibration and periodic structure made of alternating metal and glass beads that are glued together. Ideally, we expect vibrations with frequencies in the stop band to die out, and sometimes they do. In other times, however, the vibrations disappear in the middle of the structure, but show up at the edges, like in the second figure in the top right, bottom right here. So why does this happen? In theoretical studies, researchers assume these periodic patterns repeat infinitely, but that's an idealized scenario. A real structure will have edges, which will disrupt the periodic pattern that is so essential for this to work. 
So there's currently no rule to predict what will happen, and we need to run calculations on a case-by-case -case basis. This has long been a stumbling block for researchers in this field. To overcome this challenge, I developed a mathematical model that takes in the relevant variables for a periodic structure and outputs a general rule of thumb that enables us to predict in advance the performance of these periodic structures. My hope is that this brings us one step closer towards controlling waves in periodic media and using them in real life applications that aspire to mimic the intricacy and effectiveness of nature. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. In order to give our judges a couple of minutes to jot down their notes, I will be doing a very brief interview with each one of our presenters this afternoon. So I get to start with Mary. Mary, I understand that you like to sing. What style or genres of music do you like to sing? Oh, I actually like singing in general. <laughs> so usually pop music. I come from Egypt, so also Arabic songs and stuff. I was so desperate once to sing that I even joined the South Asian, Southeastern Asian singing group. And I, sa I sang in Hindu just to be able to sing. <laughs> so. Well, that sounds great. Now I have to ask you, does aerospace engineering hold an open mic night? Um, not that I know of. <laughs> well, maybe you su 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 should suggest it and you'll find out which other of your colleagues know how to sing. I look forward that idea. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the many uh, passions of the future Dr. Bostaros uh, is swimming. Would you recommend swimming to your fellow graduate students? I would but I would wait for COVID first to pass. <laughs> and, then, and then I would recommend it. It's really relaxing. Are, are, there, if you're a grad are, are there particular uh, strokes or do you like doing open water? Uh, no, I just like really, I, I'm, I'm really a bit like, I, am, I like swimming, but I'm not that much of a professional. So I just do like breaststroke and freestyle and that's it. Like, right. Well, I agree with you. It's very relaxing. Thank yeah. you so much, Mary, for being our first presenter today. Thank you, Bud. Absolutely. And next, we're going to welcome Kristen Callahan, a student in a Department of Mechanical Engineering and Interdisciplinary Quantitative Biology. Her presentation today is Bio-Inspired Wheel Treads Enable Robots to Search for Colon Cancer. Thanks, bud. Think about what you ate for dinner last night. By now, it's reached your colon and your body is absorbing the water and electrolytes from the food that you ate. For proper absorption, the colon has nearly two meters squared of surface area. That means if we were to unravel it and lay it flat, it would be as big as a twin size bed. Now, all that surface area is great for digestion, but it also leaves a lot of places for cancer to hide. Nearly one in 24 people in the United States are at risk of developing colorectal cancer in their lifetime. But if it's diagnosed early, the chances of survival are 90%. Sadly, it's often caught at later stages because patients tend to avoid colonoscopies and this drops the survival rate to 15%. During a colonoscopy, a physician pushes a camera on the end of a flexible tube through the colon to search for cancer. However, this can cause the bowels to stretch or loop around themselves. And this makes this procedure quite challenging for physicians. It's like trying to snake a drain with a cooked spaghetti noodle. These challenges have motivated our lab to develop an alternative approach. We've created a robotic platform for automated colonoscopies. Imagine a tiny tank-like robot that has been shrunk down like the magic school bus and engineered to autonomously move through the colon and inspect for cancer. This robotic device will reduce patient pain and discomfort, eliminating the need for costly patient sedation, and ultimately improving this experience for both patients and physicians. Now that the robotic platform exists, the hard part is making it drive on the mucus-covered, squishy walls of the colon. Without adequate traction, the robot wheels spin in place on the tissue, just like the wheels of your car when it's stuck in a bank of snow. In the case of a car, we can just add chains to the wheels, but it's not so simple for our robot since this delicate tissue environment is like driving on jello. 
To solve this problem, we look to nature for inspiration. Have you ever wondered how a tree frog can jump across wet, slippery, algae-covered rocks without falling? Well, it turns out the cells that make up their toe pads create a very tiny pattern texture that enhances their grip. My work sets out to replicate these pattern textures and optimize them for use as the wheel treads on our robot. To do this, I use a microscope to take pictures of different pattern textures as they slide across tissue-like materials. Then I can stitch these pictures together like a time-lapse to visualize and understand how these materials stick and slip against each other. Using this method, I've identified design parameters to optimize the wheel treads for traction on slimy tissue. So when you're due for your next colonoscopy, hopefully you'll be relieved that a tiny robot can do the inspection without you even knowing it's there. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, Kristen has lived in Santa Rosa, California and in Tucson, Arizona before coming to Boulder. Now I know that you like to mountain bike. Where do you like to hit the trails? Um, thanks, bud. I actually just started mountain biking in COVID, during COVID. Um, and so I really like, um, I've been up to Potasso and then also uh, Marshall Mesa is right by my house. Um, so I like to bike over there. Um, and we, over the summer, I used to bike kind of like on a weekly basis, which is nice. Uh, not so nice in the cold temperatures we've been having lately. Right. Very true. What made you choose mountain biking instead of getting a COVID puppy? <laughs> well, I already have a dog, oh. um, so I didn't want another puppy. Uh, my roommates actually got a puppy, so I got to live that vicariously through them. Um, and I like mountain biking, like being outside. Um, I also like something that will take my mind off work, so it's hard to focus on other things when you're zooming down a mountain. Um, you kind of need to focus your attention there, so I enjoy it a lot. Very true. You know, on a cold day like this with snow on the ground, it's hard to think that spring is actually around the corner. When it does get warmer, uh, what do you plan to plant in your garden? Um, so I always love planting tomatoes. So I always do tomatoes and peppers. Um, so those are my two go-tos and then usually some herbs, stuff like that. Um, for years now, I've been trying to grow carrots and I can not get that to work. Uh, so maybe this next, next spring. Well, good luck with the carrots. Now, I know that most graduate students have very little free time. So I'm very curious how you decide what books to read for fun when you, you know, can steal away some time at a coffee shop. So how do you pick what you're going to read next? Um, I usually just go based off of recommendations. Um, actually, during COVID, some friends of mine from college, we started to read books together. Um, so now we pick a book each month and, and read that uh, together and talk about it kind of like a book club. So um, that's been nice. It's a good way to just have other people pick books for me, um, which I enjoy. That sounds great. Thank you, Kristen, so much for participating today. Thank you. Thank you. And next up, uh, we're going to welcome Ian Collett. Uh, he's a PhD student in Aerospace Engineering Sciences, and his presentation today is Probing Hurricane Winds with GPS. Thanks so much, bud. We've probably all used GPS, the Global Positioning System. I grew up hiking in Colorado, and I often use GPS to stay on track and stay safe in the outdoors. This technology is enabled by the several dozen GPS satellites in orbit around Earth. GPS is not without its challenges. In particular, GPS signals interact with the environment as they travel from space down to us on Earth. The signals get scattered through the atmosphere or reflected from the surface. Consider this scenario. I'm hiking through a narrow valley flanked on either side by towering mountains. With these surroundings, GPS signals are prone to being reflected from the mountainside. As a result, the position reported on the map on my phone could be off by 100 feet. But no, thankfully I did not tumble off of a cliff. That's just a GPS positioning error. With this in mind, it seems like GPS signal reflections are bad news. But let's be more optimistic. 
If a GPS signal interacts with the environment, can we use it to learn about that environment? The answer is yes. Otherwise, my thesis would be in trouble. I do research about one such application, which is using GPS signals reflected from the ocean to measure ocean winds. I work with data collected by a small satellite named Cygnus, which receives and records these ocean reflected signals. How do we measure wind in this way? Well, have you ever stood on the shore of a lake and looked down at the reflection on the water? You might notice that ripples on the surface distort the image. Something similar happens when a GPS signal is reflected from the ocean. Blowing wind makes waves, which distort the GPS signal. We use this information to infer the wind. So in other words, we're MacGyvering a new ocean wind sensor using GPS signals that are already being transmitted anyway. As of now, Cygnus can measure wind speed, but not wind direction. With wind speed measurements, scientists can better forecast the strength of hurricanes. If we find a way to get the wind direction too, scientists could also see the formation of hurricanes, which occurs when powerful winds start to circulate. Here's where I come in. I am developing a method to estimate wind direction from the Cygnus data. The secret behind my method is a new way of combining the data to isolate features that depend most strongly on wind direction. My method works well with simulated data, and I'm currently assessing its performance with the real Cygnus data. If successful, my method would provide a completely new source of global ocean wind direction measurements, more than 1 million new measurements per day. So GPS, it turns out the same technology that helps keep me safe in the outdoors can help keep safe the population living in hurricane impacted areas. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Thanks so As much. As you just heard, Ian grew up in Colorado and enjoys hiking and skiing. Ian, if it was nice weather today, where, and you could head out to a trail right now, where would you go? Oh, that's a good question. Well, the weather is certainly nicer than the past couple of days, so things are looking up. <laughs> Very uh, if, I, if I could go anywhere, it would probably be on top of a mountain. I've been into the, the 14ers since my senior year of high school. Mm. For those of you who don't know, there's our mountains in Colorado that are at least 14,000 feet tall. So I'd like to be up there, uh, but winter is a, a tougher time to be up there for sure. <laughs> for sure. Uh, now, like Kristen, Ian also enjoys reading, but Ian also plays the ukulele. So how did that come into your life? Uh, the ukulele. Well, I had a friend in high school who went on a vacation to Hawaii and he picked up a ukulele and started playing it. And I thought it was so cool. So I got one too. And yeah, it's gone on since then. Wow. Have you had a chance to go to Hawaii? I have, yeah. And so I got a small kind of dinky little ukulele to start out with before I went to Hawaii. And then when I went on a vacation there a couple of years after I started playing, I picked up a, a really nice one once I knew that I was really into it. Well, you know, like we were talking earlier, I think aerospace engineering needs to start holding open mic nights for y'all to show off your skills. <laughs> Absolutely. Although I was nervous enough here, I think I might be even more nervous well, playing ukulele. You're and doing singing. great. You're doing great. Now, I also understand that you have a new puppy, Paprika. That's right. I chose the puppy over mountain biking. <laughs> <laughs> and so where'd the dog's name come from? Uh, well, my wife and I, we've always thought it was a cute name for a puppy. So we ended up choosing that. And it turned out she's, she's kind of spicy. So it, it fits the name Paprika. Perfect. Well, thank you, Ian, for your time today. We appreciate you being in the competition. Thank you. And next, we're going to welcome Zachary Decker. Zachary is a PhD student in physical chemistry. And his presentation today is flying through nighttime smoke to understand air quality. Thanks, bud. Hello, everybody. In 2002, the Haven Fire was Colorado's largest wildfire, and that smoke traveled hundreds of miles, covering dozens of towns. A kid at the time, I mistook the ash falling into my backyard for snow, and I went outside to play. 
But today the Hayman fire is our fourth largest wildfire, displaced by three fires that all burned in 2020. Partly due to human caused climate change, wildfires are increasing. As such, the smoke exposure and the associated health impacts are increasing as well. For example, towns impacted by wildfire smoke also have increased cases of influenza and even COVID-19. These health impacts are partly caused by a material in the smoke that unlike ash, we can't see with the naked eye. There are thousands of molecules in smoke. And as the smoke ages, these molecules form tiny micron-sized particles, which give smoke its thick and dark appearance. These particles can lodge themselves into our lung tissue, like micron-sized Trojan horses. Particle formation in smoke is a chemical battle between thousands of different reactions happening simultaneously. Each reaction has a different potential to form particles, and there are a few that we know to look out for. But like any battle, there is an underdog. And for smoke, that underdog is the NO3 molecule, or nitrate. Nitrate is unique because it is destroyed by sunlight. Nitrate is the Dracula of molecules because most scientists only think about it at night. Therefore, particle formation by nitrate had been largely overlooked in smoke. So we asked the question, how important is nitrate chemistry for particle formation in smoke? And how is that going to affect our air quality? To study this, we had to sample the smoke directly. That meant convincing pilots to fly us and 1,700 pounds of scientific equipment through smoke in mountainous terrain. And if that isn't hard enough, we had to do it all in the dark. But we did. We were the first group to conduct an aircraft field mission designed to sample nighttime smoke. And here's what we found. Nighttime smoke is incredibly important. We found that for smoke emitted at sunset, Nitrate chemistry produced the majority of some molecules that went on to form particles. But here's an even bigger takeaway. We found the same result in a daytime smoke plume too. This means that nitrate chemistry may be forming a lot of the particles that seep into our cities and fall into your backyard both night and day. Our research helps firefighters decide when to initiate controlled burns and helps inform air quality models so that we all know when it's safest to be outside. And as we all become more familiar with smoke ash in the coming years, my research helps us reduce our risk to the smoke's harmful effects. Thank you. And thank you, Zachary. Uh, like many students at CU, Zachary enjoys outdoor activities that our beautiful state provides. But Zachary has taken this to another level and is, and is an executive officer in the CU Hiking Club. How did that come to be? Uh, so I, I, when I joined CU uh, four years ago, the hiking club holds social hours and I went to one of the social hours and then just took off from there. Went on a bunch of hikes with them, eventually became a trip leader and now I'm an executive officer. Can't say it's the best time to be an executive officer for a, a university club, but <laughs> uh, I still really enjoy it. Absolutely. And so, uh, what kind of hikes does the club uh, help organize? Uh, all kinds. Um, anything from something short that's in Boulder, like Sanitas, maybe just a quick few hours, all the way to a, a week-long trip in Utah, uh, backpacking through the backcountry of Utah. So huge range of types of trips. 14ers are in there as well. Wow. Um, it's it's great, yeah. Oh, how amazing. Uh, I know that you're also the senior editor of Science Buffs, a CU blog. So where can we find uh, Science Buffs? Yeah, so we have a, a website and a podcast. It's sciencebuffs.org. Uh, it's a, a great group. Uh, I uh, love working with all the, the team there. It's a group of graduate students that basically uh, write our own pieces and then peer edit our own pieces. Uh, and we put them up on the blog. And then our editor, our past editor-in-chief, Elson Gilchrist, started a great podcast um, called Buffs Talk Science. And we do something very similar, but just in a podcast form. Oh, great. Uh, can you share with us maybe one of your favorite uh, blog posts or podcasts from Science Buffs? Yeah, so one of my, we have a uh, type of post that I think I really like is called the um, 10 hundred word challenge. It's very similar to the three minute thesis, but you uh, describe your research in the uh, the most used 1000 words. 
uh, 1,000 isn't a word, isn't, or 1,000 isn't one of those words, so it's 10 hundred. Um, so it's another challenging way to describe research using very simple words. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And next yeah, thank up, you. Yeah, my, my pleasure. Next up, we have Shirley Huang. She is a PhD student in speech, language, and hearing sciences. And her presentation today is Emotions in Bilingual Children. Thanks, bud. All of us have felt happy and sad, but have you ever had an obscure feeling that's hard to describe and label in a single word? In Cantonese, a Chinese language, the word fai lok means fleeting joy with your family during the holidays. The word sung sum means a broken heart from missing someone deeply. These words don't just mean happy and sad. They're more nuanced to capture these precise emotions. As a child of immigrants who grew up speaking Cantonese and English, I know what it's like to use different languages to give meaning to my emotions. Research shows that children who label their feelings have fewer behavioral problems, better social skills, and greater control over their emotions. And this has been linked to school success, learning attitudes, and positive peer relationships. While we know that emotions are important in children, we still know very little about emotions in bilingual children who grow up speaking two languages. They learn differently from children who speak only one language. Many are immigrants or children of immigrants who are adjusting to a new school and adapting to a new culture. How we talk about and understand emotions differ across languages and cultures. First, there isn't always a direct one-to-one -one English translation for an emotion in another language. Second, the society where we live has different cultural values for positive and negative emotions. And third, parents' language choice when talking about emotions influences how children learn them. So how do children who use two languages and grow up in two cultures learn emotions? That's where my research comes in. I'm a child language scientist and a speech language pathologist. I develop different tests to measure emotion skills in bilingual children who speak Cantonese at home and learn English at school. These tests examine their ability to recognize facial expressions, tell stories using different emotion words, and label emotions in others. And this was done in both languages. My analysis will compare across languages to identify differences in how children learn emotions. I will also examine whether cultural factors predict emotion skills. This has never been done with this population. My work could help schools develop a social emotional curriculum that aligns with bilingual children's language and cultural experiences, creating a more inclusive environment for children from diverse backgrounds. So the next time that you have this obscure feeling that's hard to describe and label in a single word, I want you to remember how beautiful it is that other languages can capture and give voice to these feelings. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. Um, I know that you are an avid reader and that you like psychological thrillers. So what are you reading right now? Yes, I really enjoy reading psychological thrillers. Um, I'm reading, I'm actually reading an Amazon Prime book right now called uh, When She Returned. It's about the main character was abducted by a cult and then she returned back home and now she's integrating back into society. And then you r reveal all these mysteries about her life in this cult. Wow, well, that certainly is a change of pace from your day-to-day -day <laughs> research. Uh, is there a, a, another psychological thriller that sort of stands out in terms of your sort of COVID lockdown uh, routine? Oh, um, well, I, I really want to actually start reading Stacey Abrams books. So I just found out that she is an author and she's written like a lot of romantic thrillers. And so I want to kind of get into that genre right now. <laughs> so it's a nice change from reading manuscripts and articles. Absolutely. Well, and I had no idea that Stacey Abrams had this whole other career. <laughs> wow. 
So I understand that you also enjoy yoga. So have you been trying to keep up your practice with online or just working on your own? Um, I just do yoga online off, uh, or in my home. I mean, obviously I can't go into the yoga studios anymore. That was, that used to be part of my like weekly exercise practice just to kind of unwind from, from work. But now I just kind of do it at home in my apartment. Yeah, no, we, we've all had to make all sorts of accommodations for the time we're in. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shirley, for joining us. Thank, Thank you, bud. Thank you for participating. Next up, we have Jeremiah Osborne Gowie. He's a PhD student in environmental studies, and his presentation today is Migrations Influence Bangladeshi Farmers. Thanks, bud. Appreciate it. Imagine you're sitting in your home, a little cottage at the edge of a small field on a riverbank just inland from the sea. And your farm has just been ravaged by a huge storm. The fields where you cultivate your crops are now flooded in seawater. You're probably not going to get much of a crop this year, maybe none. And as you sit at the kitchen table with your spouse, you realize you're facing some of the most difficult and perhaps consequential decisions of your life. Will you be able to feed your family? Can you even continue farming as your family has here for generations? And your two eldest children, whom you count on for helping on the farm, they're of an age where they're starting to look for jobs of their own, maybe even moving away. And you have to decide, do you keep them here to help or do you send them away as migrants in hopes they can find good jobs and send money back home? Now, this sort of scenario plays out in millions of households around the world, including Bangladesh, a country with a lot of farmers facing challenging environmental conditions like storms and flooding, erosion and drought, maybe all of these in the same year. And for many families, their best option might be to send their eldest children away in hopes that they can find paying jobs and send money home. But for these farmers, nearly all of whom rely on their children to help with the daily activities needed to run a farm, sending your kids away can have very real consequences on your farming livelihood. Now, we know a lot about the experiences of migrants when they leave, and we know some about what happens to people that remain behind, but we know relatively little about how these things may affect the farmer's ability to continue farming if they have to take on additional jobs or switch to entirely different non-farming jobs just to make ends meet. And in places where it's already difficult to feed a growing population, let alone your own family, what we call food insecurity. Knowing whether people in households that send a migrant can continue farming or if they have to quit farming altogether as a result, knowing this is a very important piece of the puzzle for solving food insecurity issues. Now to start exploring this, we went to Bangladesh and conducted extensive surveys with people over 4,000 households about their experiences with farming and migration. And using discrete event history models and complex multi-level statistical techniques that are not commonly used to explore these types of data, we've been able to start answering some of these important questions. And what I find from talking to people around their kitchen tables is that if you're a farmer and you send a migrant, you're about 45% less likely to switch jobs. You basically stick to being a farmer. You double down on farming. Now, these findings are particularly important for development programs in food insecure areas because while farming is hard and many people are leaving rural areas to migrate to cities, these results indicate that farmers tend to stick to being farmers, even when times are tough and environmental pressures are bearing down. And in a tough, unforgiving world filled with so much uncertainty, that farmers can continue farming and feeding their families, even producing food for the rest of us, this is good news. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremiah. Thank you, bud. Now, I, I've heard that one of your favorite activities is to go foraging in the forest. <laughs> so if we were to go on one of Jeremiah's forest foraging expeditions, what are we going to be looking for? Um, it depends on the time of year, uh, since there's stuff to get out there and eat uh, in many seasons. Um, in the spring, uh, there's a lot of asparagus. Wild asparagus grows all over Colorado. Um, so I love to forage for asparagus. Mushrooms start popping in the spring too. Um, all kinds of different mushrooms spring through the summer. Uh, and um, in particular, morels are a lovely mushroom to hunt for in burn areas. Wow, that, that, I need to go on a journey with you sometime. <laughs> I'll um, take you, bud. <laughs> good, good. Uh, like Kristen, I understand that you're also a gardener. So when it does get warmer, what's going to be planted in your garden? 
<laughs> well, I built my partner a raised bed, um, and we have this fun uh, banter back and forth. How come I plant stuff in her raised bed? But uh, we, we love to garden for things that you can can, salsas, um, so any of the garlic, onion, peppers, tomatoes, tomatillos, those sorts of things. She loves to grow corn, um, and then lots of herbs and stuff. We have some backyard ducks that are fun to plant things, let new growth come up, and them to nibble on. I am definitely coming over to your house. <laughs> so I understand that you also, in addition to being a gardener, also are a home brewer. So what do you have going on during your COVID isolation? <laughs> well, I'm not brewing anything at the moment uh, here, um, but I am still consuming some, uh, some different home brews. Um, at the moment, uh, I'm really into some of the darker um, wintertime beers, some, some of the winter warmers, um, some of the stouts. Uh, and February is, uh, is barrel-aged month and stout month in many places. So drinking different stouts right now. Wow. Well, it's been fascinating talking to you, uh, Jeremiah. Thank you so much Thank for you, participating bud. today. Next up, we're going to go to Andales Osorio de la Rosa. She is a PhD student in the School of Education, and her presentation today is Expansive Family Engagement Toward Education as a Community-Wide Effort. Gracias, bud. Thank you. When I started my journey as a PhD student in the bilingual education field, I was oblivious about the 70 year old troubled, contradicting and abusive history of bilingual education in the United States. Like segregated schools, single same approaches to learning, the belief that emerging English bilingual students have a problem rather than an asset, lack of accountability to and marginalization of bilingual students' families, even today, the word bilingual has come to mean students from brown or black, poor immigrant families. So along the way, I decided to embrace the study of engagement of bilingual Mexican American families, as they like to be called. I did so because through community based research, it's possible to inspire change. So let me tell you about Senora Alicia, a US citizen, a passionate community leader at Ryan 05, a quote unquote, poor district serving 85% Mexican American youth, of whom 50% are emerging bilingual students here in Colorado. About 20 years ago, two of Senora Alicia's bilingual children were diagnosed with special needs. But when she learned that by law, her children had a right to educational supports, both for being bilingual and for having special needs, it was too late to undo a lifetime of mistreatment and inadequate access to quality education for her children. Nadie debe pasar por eso. No one should have to endure that, Senora Alicia laments. In spite of the district's treatment of herself, for the past eight years, Senora Alicia has taken responsibility for cultivating leadership skills in the bilingual families around her community. She shows them how to partner with educators at Ryan 05. After all, it is by working together with the same district that negated her other two kids a college education that her last child has been able to apply for and be accepted into a four-year college. Senora Alicia has it clear. They need to educate themselves about what we bring to the table and recognize that mother's work is an act of love and a healing process. Indeed, research shows that educators at four school districts need to expand their conceptualization of family involvement into believing that mothers like Senora Alicia are more than capable of building equitable partnerships with them. In the spirit of thinking about education as a community-wide effort like Senora Alicia does, what's one thing you can do to support change for bilingual children in public schools this year? Believe it or not, the wider community, which includes you and me, affects the kind of education that Senora Alicia's children get at their public schools. Perhaps pay it forward? Think about informing yourself and others and vote to fund public education in the next election. Like Senora Alicia, we might find healing in taking responsibility together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anhalis. Um, <laughs> I understand that you and your three-year-old son like to dance. What is his name? His name is Diego. We Diego? have a whole theme. Yes. 
And so uh, what kind of music do you and Diego like to dance to? Well, you know, with a Latin mother, of course, we like salsa, bachata, um, cumbias. That sounds great. So do you have, have you made any TikTok videos and posted oh my them gosh. yet? It, that's a great question. No, um, but uh, it, it's the thought has yeah crossed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I, I look forward to seeing you there. I, I also understand that you enjoy singing. Uh, what types of songs do you like to sing? Oh my gosh. So it depends on, you know, the weather and how I'm feeling. So I can go from, <laughs> okay, I can go from opera or like a Requiem by Verdi mm. or, <laughs> or, you know, like Shakira and I don't know, <laughs> some like kind of thing. <laughs> well, I I think the variety is really good. So depending on, yeah, the weather, how you feel, you mm -hmm. can have all sorts of genres <laughs> of music to go to. That's I, right. I love it. Uh, so I, I also understand that you're a runner. So yeah. when it does get a little bit warmer, uh, what trails or what paths do you want to run first? But I need to make an, uh, uh, I need to, to clarify something. I'm an aspire, aspiring runner. Ah. <laughs> Um, I don't, I used to run like 10 Ks, um, but you know, with my child now, you know, family um, and a PhD, then that I, I had to cut that into like to seven Ks, even to five Ks sometimes. Um, but I like to go to Prospect Park, mm. which is in Whitridge, very close to I-70 and like Golden area. Well, if you're, since you're a mother of a three-year-old, you are not an aspiring runner. You are a runner. You're getting plenty of steps in. That's so true. <laughs> Running behind him, you mean. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Annalise, for being with us today. Thank you. Next up, we have Varsha Rao. He's a PhD student in chemical and biological engineering. And his presentation today is Movie Sets for Cells. Thanks, bud. Our skeleton is remarkable. When you have broken a bone, in many cases, a simple cast is enough to hold the bones in place while they just heal themselves. And even if you haven't broken anything, throughout our lifetimes, our bones are constantly breaking and reforming microscopically within our bodies. In our first year of life, this process is working so fast that almost 100% of your skeleton is completely replaced. But as we age, this process slows down and our bones become more brittle and are more likely to break. For people over the age of 50, you're between 25 and 50% more likely to experience a fracture. And that fracture is less likely to heal properly, requiring surgery and years of rehabilitation. In patients with severe bone loss, only 15%. 15% are able to walk across the room unaided six months after a hip fracture. So what can we do about this? The project I work on is to develop better therapy options for bone fractures that are unable to heal on their own. To do this, I'm studying the cells responsible for directing proper fracture healing in healthy bone. Imagine these cells as movie directors on a Hollywood set. Once the bone is broken, these director cells go come to the fracture area and send instructions or signals to the surrounding bones and initiate and coordinate the complicated healing process. These surrounding cells are like the cast and the crew in our movie. In the past, scientists have tried to add the director cells straight to the fracture area. Instead of promoting bone healing, the cells died and were removed by the immune system within hours. Just as a director would not be able to make a movie without a set, our cells need a supportive and protective place to work. That's where my research comes in. I'm a chemical engineer and a set designer. I'm developing housing environments or movie sets to deliver cells safely to the fracture area. I design cellular movie sets to, that protect the cells and help them signal. Here's what I found. An environment that allows the cells to be in close physical contact with one another was the best at causing increased signaling. A movie cannot be made without a well-organized cast and crew. Similarly, my cells cannot effectively communicate and signal without each other. 
an environment that is designed to increase cellular connections is the best setting to help cells produce important bone healing signals. I mentioned before that about 100% of our skeleton is replaced each year during our first year of life. As adults, only about 10% is replaced each year. We cannot fully stop the process of aging. Eventually though, I hope these types of technologies will be widely available to anyone with a fracture that doesn't heal properly. Thank you. Thank you, Varsha. Thanks. So like Ian, I know that you enjoy hiking, skiing. Uh, so if it was nice weather today and you could head, head for a trail right now, where would you go? Yeah, I think um, if it was nice weather today, I probably would go up with um, one of the flat irons. They actually become um, quite inaccessible once it gets pretty cold. It can be pretty icy up there, but it is really a beautiful hike and you get a wonderful view of Boulder at the top. So it's pretty gorgeous up there. Yeah, I completely agree. Every time I go up there, I just I, yeah. I'm amazed how beautiful it is. Now, I also understand that you are a mean trivia player. <laughs> yeah. what, what categories are you best at? Um, probably, well, obviously science, that has to be the top, um, but I do pretty well in like movie trivia categories um, and like usually some like of the listening kind of musical ones, um, I'm pretty good at too. Good, well, and speaking of movies, uh, when we're able to return to movie theaters, uh, are there any summer movies that are already on your calendar to see on the big screen? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know if there's any big summer movies. I, I mean, actually, like one of the movies that I still would really like to see on the big screen is Tenet, which was Christopher Nolan's movie that got released. Um, I think I'm kind of saving that one for my next summer to watch it on the movie, <laughs> big screen, yeah. Well, I look forward to seeing you and everybody else in the movie theaters and in the yeah. live theaters when it's safe to do so. Me too, yeah. Thanks again for your time. Thank you. Bye. Next up, we have Vishal Ray. He's a PhD student in aerospace engineering and his presentation today is the story of space junk. Thanks, bud. <laughs> Just close your eyes for a moment and imagine two astronauts floating in the inky darkness of outer space. It's so still and peaceful, but suddenly there's chaos everywhere. A cloud of space junk is hurtling towards them at tens of thousands of miles per hour. At such speeds, even a one inch bolt is like a hand grenade. But this is not the story of Sandra Bullock and George Clooney from the film Gravity. This is the origin story of our villain, space junk. In the movie, the space chunk is created by the intentional destruction of a satellite. But there's another source for trash in space, the collision of satellites. Before you call it sci-fi, in 2009, two satellites did actually collide with each other and created thousands of pieces of space debris. Keep in mind that satellites are indispensable to our society. So at the rate this is going, you can say goodbye to mobile networks, weather forecasting, natural disaster monitoring, and many other things. But why would satellites even collide when, you know, space seems endless? The thing is, satellites travel around Earth on specific paths that engineers design called orbits. And with the exponentially growing satellite population, these orbits are getting overcrowded. It would still have been fine if we could pinpoint the exact location of a satellite in its orbit, but that becomes difficult due to the pressure of air. You heard that right. Contrary to the popular belief that all satellites travel in the vacuum of space, many of them are actually within our planet's atmosphere. And our atmosphere exerts a pressure on the satellite called air drag and knocks it out of its original orbit. I mean, think about the last time you went out walking on a windy day. Wasn't it real hard to keep walking straight? A poor satellite knocked out by a couple of inches will end up in a very different place than where it was supposed to be. That's why it's absolutely critical to model this air drag accurately. Not to mention, improving these models of air drag will tell us a great deal about our planet's atmosphere, which is really important when studying things like climate change. 
And that's precisely what I have been trying to do through my research. I am developing mathematical models of teardrop by utilizing satellite tracking data. Just like the GPS on your phone. Honestly, growing up, when I used to gaze at the night sky with wonder, I never imagined that one day we would have to solve humanity's trash problem in space. Ultimately, using my research, I am trying to better our models of atmosphere and at the same time, improve our estimates of the satellite's location in space to prevent catastrophic collisions in the future. So that eventually, when they decide to make a sequel to gravity, they don't have a real life example to base it on. Thank you. Thank you, Vishal. So I understand that you have a telescope. Yeah, so I do. This last year has had some pretty amazing night sky events. What have been your favorites? Yeah, actually. So we had the conjunct conjunction between Jupiter and Saturn, right? So you could see both the planets in the same field of view. And it was just amazing. It was just amazing. I took some of my friends out there to see that. And wow, they were amazed too. It was great. Uh, it was. So where do you set up to get away from the light pollution? So I looked at different places. My favorite is Rocky Mountain National Park. There's the Discovery Learning, this Discovery Park uh, parking lot. And there you have very dark skies. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of safe, so. <laughs> yeah, no, it really was amazing. And I, I, I didn't even have good equipment, but it was still amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I know that in addition to hiking, you also like to camp. So when it warms up, where are you looking forward to pitching your first tent? Yeah, I actually started camping like last year because of the pandemic. I think the pandemic has like, in, you know, <laughs> make, us, make us excited about many, many different things. Uh, I am thinking of going to, I don't know, maybe Rocky Mountains, one of the two camping a lot, camping parks, but you have to like book the parks, park a great deal before time. So yeah, that's going to be difficult. Yeah, it's something you can't do on the spur of the moment anymore. You no, you can't, really you can't. You have, to, you have to plan months in advance and I am not a great planner, which is, <laughs> does not go hand in hand with like camping. Right. I know it's, it's, it's a real uh, shift in our thinking, but uh, I yeah. hope you plan ahead so you can get that camping in. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bashal. And next up, we have Mike Zawoski. He's a PhD student in geological sciences, and his presentation today is Are Earth's Oldest Fossils from 3.7 Billion Year Old Rocks? Thanks. What do you think is the most exciting question in all of science? I'd argue it's about the origin of life. I look for evidence of this origin from single-celled life, microbes like bacteria that take part in building structures. The earliest, best preserved history of life on Earth is found in these structures called stromatolites. It's Greek for layered rock. In 2016, researchers reported finding stromatolites in 3.7 billion year old rocks. Before then, the oldest were from 3.5 billion. What's so significant about 200 million years? Let's use a scale model to put that in perspective. If Earth formed at the bottom of my feet four and a half billion years ago, the top of my head is the present. Dinosaurs went extinct here. Animal life diversified dramatically here. During the next three billion years, microbes ruled the Earth. 3.5 and 3.7 billion years ago occur here on my calf. And as we head towards Earth's formation, we reach an unknown point when life would have been impossible. We had liquid rock at the surface and all those asteroid impacts. That's why finding evidence of Earth, of life close to Earth's origin is a big deal. So we headed towards Greenland to assess these rocks. Breakthrough number one occurred when I noticed that these structures had a very different shape than normal stromatolites. Imagine an overturned egg carton where each stromatolite forms a dome. On the rock face, these structures appear to have this shape, but a closer look and further test revealed that these structures were ridges that extended through the rock. Stromatolites are layered. It was unclear from the rock face whether these structures were layered as proposed. Breakthrough number two came in the lab. 
scans by other researchers, only scanning portions of the sample hinted at possible layers. On the left are our scans from a younger biologic stromatolite, layered, right? On the lower right are our scans from the Greenland rocks. By scanning the entire feature, we found that the cores of these structures lack the necessary layers to be called stromatolites. Determining whether something that looks like a stromatolite is biologic or not is more than yes or no. Evidence helps swing the pendulum toward or away from a biologic origin. In this case, the lack of layers and stretch ridges helps us constantly swing the pendulum toward a non-biologic origin from deforming the rocks at high temperatures and pressures. In the end, we help determine what isn't life in some of Earth's oldest rocks. For researchers, it can be just as useful to have a list of criteria that swings the pendulum toward as well as away from a biologic origin. So the search for older life continues. And when we find it, the medical and technological breakthroughs could be significant. And also, we all want to know who were our oldest ancestors. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. So I understand that when you go skiing, that chairlifts are not for you. You, uh, you wrote that you like to climb up mountains and then ski down. So where's your go-to places for backcountry skiing? Well, being a busy PhD student, they're close to Boulder. So I like to go to places like Rocky Mountain National Park or up in the Indian Peaks, just west of, of Boulder there is one of my favorite places. Yeah, yeah, you don't have a whole lot of time. So That's right. uh, growing up, what was it about the natural world that got you so excited about geology? Well, I don't know if I found geology right away. We like to do lots of things in the outdoors with my dad. And so I spent lots of time you know, being outside that way. And so in some respects, I just knew the outdoors was interesting for me. And I came to Colorado because I had cousins who lived here. And I don't know, I perceived that skiing was the thing to do for there. And so then then it was really later when I got into the sciences that I really learned how much, how geology was so much different than the initial astronomy that I was into. I realized that naked eye astronomy was kind of a lot easier because there were only five planets, so many constellations, the one moon, and a few other objects. Whereas geology, you can walk 100 feet and have crossed over and lost a billion years worth of time. And so it's, it's kind of much more complicated to interpret it with your naked eye. So it led me to get more schooling. Great. So what's your favorite kind of geological formation right here in Boulder? Ooh, right here in the Boulder. Well, I really like gravel to, in a geologic sense. And so I really like the flat irons because they're made of old gravelly deposits. But I like all the big terraces where NCAR sits and some of these other mesas are really these thick deposits from ancient streams that extend out into the, you know, out into the Denver area even. And so those are some of my favorite places. Yeah, I mean, it really is amazing that we have a laboratory, literally, that we live inside of. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Actually, Bud, you're the one who's always asking the questions. What about this tie you're wearing? It looks really spectacular. Can you tell oh. us about that? Well, it is uh, flowers. Oh, nice. I've been looking at it the whole time, wondering what's on there. And so yeah, what the I heck have my is chance that? to ask. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. All right. Hope that didn't derail things. Thank you. Yeah. So that concludes our 10 presenters today, and uh, I wish we were all in the space together, but uh, if you would just give a virtual round of applause for our amazing students this afternoon. Uh, next up, uh, hopefully we'll uh, have the slide up that has the URL for the People's Choice Award. There we are. So you're going to have a couple of minutes uh, to make your choices. Uh, and just to remind uh, ourselves, our first place winner this evening is going to receive $1,500 in research funds. The runner up will receive $750 and the winner chosen by you of the People's Choice Award will win $500 in research funds. Now I know by your, pre your participation today that you are already fans of CU Boulder and the Graduate School, but I'm gonna brag about them just for a minute. For non-medical school institutions, CU is number one in funding from the National Institute of Health. CU also ranks number one in funding from NASA for public universities, 
And when you take all universities, private and public, we come in second with funding from NASA. CU research by our faculty and students has led to the creation of over 190 new companies just in the last 25 years. The CU Graduate School is very dedicated to supporting our students and annually they distribute almost $4 million through university funded fellowships and grants to help our students proceed through their time here with us. The Graduate School houses over 6,000 students from all around the world and you heard it just from 10 of them today. So imagine multiplying that genius that you've just witnessed times 600. 6,000 graduate students is a lot of talented human beings walking in our midst. I hope that you have voted for the, your people's choice winner uh, we're going to need to close that voting pretty soon. And now it is my honor to welcome back the Dean of the Graduate School, Scott Adler. Hi, Bud. Thanks. You're hired as our spokesperson for the Graduate School. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm happy to be here anytime you want me. So uh, just like with our contestants today, I'm going to ask the Dean three questions. And so Scott, your first question today is, what happy discovery did you realize during the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, um, I have to say this winter, I discovered a, a new hobby that I hadn't even really given much thought to before, but it, it's, I, I really enjoy it. It's ice fishing. Uh, going out onto a frozen lake, uh, you know, a little pop-up tent and a little heater and spending the day with your, uh, with, with your uh, rod in the water in a hole and uh, pulling the fish out in the ice. Yeah, it's, wow. it's, it's actually a lot of fun. And I assume a thermos filled with something very warm. <laughs> um, yes, and something else to drink to keep you warm as well, yes. Uh, um, but it's really, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's, it's a great day. It's very relaxing. I turn off the phone, so I'm not getting texts or emails. It's, it's really a great way to get away from things. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Any excuse to turn off the phone. That sounds heavenly. Uh, so Scott, where's your favorite hike in Boulder? Um, that seems to be a common theme, not surprisingly, and, uh, for all of us living here in Colorado, uh, my wife and I did a ton of hiking this last winter, uh, last summer, sorry. Um, I would say though, the one that sort of stands out is um, the Beaver Creek Trail up to Sawtooth Mountain. I love to get up to the Continental Divide. Um, it's a long hike, but the, the one thing that's really amazing is every time I do it, we always see moose. Um, and oh. often very up close, uh, probably too close. Uh, and it, it's, it's never failed. I always see moose on that. So it, it's really a favorite. Wow, yeah, that does sound amazing. And uh, like all of us, I know you have probably quite a long list of what you're looking forward to doing again after the COVID restrictions come to an end. What's on at the top of your list? Well, I. I I, I am like everyone else out there, uh, can't wait to get back to some semblance of normal life. Uh, I think travel is probably the, the thing that I, I miss the most. Uh, my wife and I love to get away and travel a lot. Uh, as you know, we, we go to New York a lot and, and we're big theater goers, look just like you. Uh, I can't wait to start going to shows again and, and um, really sort of seeing everything that got halted. Uh, there were even a few shows that I had on my list that we I we were hoping to see or that were going to open. And uh, I'm I'm hoping Broadway uh, just gets back to operating as as it was prior to the pandemic. So travel's the big one. Where my wife and I have already have a long list of trips we're we're hoping to do. Yeah, I am right there with you. I can't wait for theaters, whether it's in Boulder or in New York, to reopen. Uh, yes, absolutely. A long time. I mean, it's really probably put a, a bit of a damper on your work. Uh, uh, 
it, given that this is uh, your subject matter. So uh, yeah, and and uh, the the Zoom efforts at doing uh, Zoom the virtual theater just doesn't quite cut it. So no, but I have to hand it to not only my colleagues here at CU Boulder, but l around the world, people have come up with incredibly inventive things to do uh, because nobody wants to, well, of course, nobody knows how long it's going to go, but uh, creativity finds ways. Uh, I just watched a Zoom performance where uh, someone, in, uh, two people in New York, so tiny, tiny apartments, they each cleaned out a closet and they made their set in their closet, filmed themselves in two different locations, and then someone spliced it all together to make a play that makes it look like they're in the same house at the same time. I wow. was just like, who would have thought? <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Yeah, I, I was quite astounded, quite astounded. Uh, yeah, and uh, our students uh, learned this year uh, how to you know, not only work around the COVID restrictions to keep everybody safe, but yeah. we've done three camera shoots. We've set up uh, basically television studios, film studios, and our theater spaces uh, in order to uh, help our students keep their craft acquisition talents going. Uh, and, you know, I, I will say for uh, our students, uh, they're just, they're rolling with the punches. They're like, okay, great, you know, what do we do next? Uh, and it's so exciting to uh, pick up with their enthusiasm uh, and lack of fear of uh, technology. <laughs> yes, yes, of course, of course. It's really been amazing to see what a lot of the faculty have done to adjust uh, in this pandemic. Uh, some, j just last spring, some amazing uh, the ability of the faculty to turn on a dime and, and come up with novel and creative ways to teach their courses when, of course, at that point, we were all yeah. in this mode, mode just on Zoom. So, yeah, it, I was really impressed. Yeah, no, it's it's been remarkable. And, and of course, our graduate students who were also doing a lot of the teaching in the classroom, too. Yeah, absolutely. So I just want to thank uh, again our four judges. Uh, just to recap, we have Tom Check, who's an uh, investigator for the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Catherine Eggert, Senior Vice Provost and Associate Vice Chancellor for Academic Planning and Assessment. We also are joined by Daryl Maeda, Associate Dean for Student Success in the College of Arts and Sciences, and Charlie Mangiano, former Senior Director and Multimedia Content Producer for Strategic Relations and Communications. And we're waiting for the tabulation of the results. So Scott, I'm gonna ask you, uh, when you did see live theater last, uh, or, or just uh, what was your favorite uh, piece of theater that you saw probably in 2019? <laughs> uh, let me think, what did we, see? what have I seen recently that I thought was I mean, some of my favorites, I did see Hamilton a couple of times. Mm. Uh, I mean, you gotta love Hamilton. It was really quite amazing. Yeah. Um, uh, what did I see in 2019? Now I, I'm, I'm blanking a little bit. I, there were a couple of things I wanted to see that we were hoping to. I, everyone in my family saw Hades Town, and I didn't get a chance mm. to see it. I, I'm hoping I'll, that'll be one of the first things I get to see. Yeah, that was on my, I had a ticket to it as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm also looking forward to Sing Street. I'm looking forward to that. I, I know that it never got a chance to open, but yeah, uh, yeah that one. So yeah, we're, um, oh, it looks like we have results now. Ah, so thank you, dear friends, for joining us. And I'm gonna turn the floor over to Scott. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Bud. You did an amazing job again. I really appreciate all the work you put into this. And, and it, it really was, uh, you just made this so interesting. Well, it's always my pleasure. All right. Well, 
Uh, first off, I want to um, thank all of the graduate students who participated in the 3MT competition throughout from the beginning. Um, they really did an amazing job. Our, our 10 finalists today, as you can see, all the work that they're doing is, is really incredible. Um, so just a round of applause to, to everyone um, for what an amazing job and some incredible research. And, and this is research, of course, that as Bud was alluding to, this is research that's really going to be quite impactful. So um, let me start with the People's Choice Awards. This was the award given out to uh, by our audience. And um, they, I, I, I see that we have an amazing number of people. We about 160, I think it was upwards of close to 200 people today. Um, so that award goes to Vishal Ray from uh, Aerospace uh, Engineering, the story of space junk. So congratulations, Vishal. Our second place, and my understanding is that the first and second place, oh, Congratulations. Yeah, I, mean, I had to put my blazer on. I was like, <laughs> quickly put the blazer on. <laughs> Congratulations, Michelle. That was, it's really incredible research you're doing. So well yeah. done. Thank you. Um, so our second and first place uh, prizes, it was extremely close. Uh, I'm told it was a half a point between uh, the second and first place. So uh, again, um, just incredible work. So second place goes to Shirley Wong of Speech, Language, and Hearing Sciences, Emotions in Bilingual Children. Well done, Thank Shirley. You. Thank you, Scott. Incredible research. I, <laughs> just to hear about you know, bilingual, how, how people deal with um, being bilingual and thinking about how they capture the emotions differently in different languages. Really incredible stuff. Thank you so much, Scott, and thank you to the judges. Well done, Shirley. Um, and finally, our first place winner, a winner of uh, $1,500 and will be uh, advancing to the a regional competition as part of the Western Association of Graduate Schools is Varsha Rao, Chemical and Biological Engineering, Movie Sets for Cells. Congratulations, Varsha. Just a Thank you. really incredible research on, on bones. And, and I, I was fascinated to hear, I didn't know that a baby's bones are really recreated yeah. every year. That's incredible to hear. Yeah. So Thank you. really amazing research and you did a great job presenting it. Thank you so much. Yes, yeah, so we're so proud that you're going to be representing us in the regional competition. That's going to be great. Really looking forward to that. Well, thank you, everyone. I appreciate everyone sticking around uh, for this competition and, and to see the great winners. Uh, it, it's really an honor to have such amazing graduate students. Uh, all of our graduate students, of course, are doing incredible work. Um, I appreciate you taking the time today and, uh, and we will see you again next year. So, uh, and thank you to all the judges. So take care everyone.